Last but not least, here we are going into our last part of acute musculoskeletal, which is hip fractures. Sorry, I saw something weird on my table. Um, so what are hip fractures? What do they look like? So um, this one's not going to be as in-depth as some of the other sections because I already kind of talked about um, fractures. So I'm going to just talk about what's different about hip fractures. Um, so you're going to see less of like the diagnostics and the other stuff and more of just what makes it different and then what are we going to do about it? So 95% of hip fractures are a result of a fall. So it's most common in older adults, you know, um, it's always the worst thing, you know, when you have an older family member and you just know they're going to fall down and break their hip and it's, it's so painful. And like we talked about hips also have a lot of your blood supply. So there can be some instability. So, but um, what's different about this fracture is they can have some of the same symptoms we talked about for other fractures, but here are four things that might be a little different. Um, patient with a hip fracture, because it is a ball and socket joint, they're going to usually have external rotation of their limbs. So external thing gets pointed out. So you can kind of see like this foot over here, their left foot, how it's pointed out. Um, that is an external rotation. Um, they may also have pretty severe muscle spasms. I talked about how hip fractures have a higher chance or higher um, incidence of muscle spasm. Um, also a shortening of the extremity. It'll make more sense, I think, in the picture I have on the next slide. But when the ball and socket joint comes out, it usually goes above the joint. So the, um, the one leg is actually going to be shorter than the other. And you can see the affected one is shorter than the unaffected one. Um, and then they usually have severe pain and tenderness around the side. So the big ones that are going to be different are think external rotation and shortening of the limb. Oh, maybe it's not this. Maybe it's going to be on the next slide. So how do we treat hip fractures? We're going to use traction. So this is where um, we very commonly use that Bucks traction until we can um, get that ball and socket joint fixed. Um, we're going to limit their movement and um, do early surgery because this is not one where we can just let it heal on its own. We have to get that um, sucker pop back into place. Or if there's an actual fracture, we need to do um, something like you can see here, there's the hip compression, a partial hip replacement or a total hip replacement. Um, so what can we do as the nurse to help this client? So the big things we can do, um, pain management is key. Um, but the big thing for these patients, aside from pain management, is preventing dislocation. So you're going to see most of what I have here is, is how to prevent them from making things worse. We just got this ball and socket fixed, um, repaired, or back into place. We do not want it to pop back out. Um, so usually, especially post-operatively, they're going to have what this um, this kind of pillow. It's called a hip abductor pillow, um, and it helps to prevent dislocation by preventing them from crossing their legs. Um, I'll talk about all the precautions and all the things you don't want them to do here shortly. Um, but one of the things we don't want them to do is cross their legs, because if you cross your legs, it can pop that new um, beautiful hip out of place. Um, they usually need physical and occupational therapy. Um, and um, they're going to do things like muscle strengthening, um, sometimes swimming, stationary cycling, just walking is helpful. They don't need to do any high impact sports, but just um, gentle and um, general exercise. Um, they made it assistive and adaptive devices um, in order to help them like things um, to help them to do activities of daily living because um, they're not going to be able to bend, lean, and do things the same way because of their hip dislocation. We'll get there um, and talk about that more in depth. Um, and then in their bed, a lot of times they're going to have what's called a trapeze bar. It literally looks like a triangle. And if you've ever seen a patient, they kind of use it to move themselves around because we don't want them flexing and doing too much, but it'll, they have to have, um, it, well, they don't have to have, but it helps um, patients, especially that might have good preserved upper body strength to help reposition themselves or get more comfortable without, um, you know, popping something out of place. Neurovascular assessment is very important. So I'm going to be watching those distal pulses, um, the dorsalis pedis, posterior tibial, capillary refill, looking for edema, looking for paralysis, temperature, color, um, movement. I'm sure I forgot one. Are you talking about swelling? I'm sure I forgot one, but you get the point. The seven P's and one C. Um, and then um, we really are going to uh, be trying to prevent complication, uh, complication, <laughs> complications um, like blood clots, because these patients can be more uh, mobile at first or just depending on their capabilities, they might not be moving as much. Ooh, select all that apply. I know you guys love these nurses discharging a client home who had a posterior hip replacement, which statement if made by the client indicates teaching was effective. So with questions like this, you always want to look and see, am I looking for what's right or what's wrong? And I'm looking for what is right. 
It's a select all that apply. So more, at least one has to be chosen at most five. But remember at my school, we usually do two to four. Um, so A, I will utilize an elevated toilet seat for the first six weeks after surgery. Well, I know these patients have special precautions and I don't want them flexing too much at the hip. So I'm going to say, yes, elevated toilet seat. I think that is effective. So um, A, effective. B, I will never be able to tie my shoes again without an adaptive device. Well, for a period of time, they're going to have limited um, ability to tie their shoes. They can't bend like that. But I don't think it's going to be that they can never tie their shoes again without an adaptive device. They may need to use that, but it's not like you really want to avoid extremes. Um, like the only extreme that we ever do is they should never smoke cigarettes again for like everything because um, smoking is no bueno. Um, but um, yeah, so you, the only net, there's very few absolutes in nursing. So I'm going to say no for this one. Um, I will need to have a trapeze bar installed at home for bed mobility. Um, so, I mean, the trape trapeze bar is helpful in the immediate post-operative period when in the hospital bed, but really once they get home, they should be getting up and getting mobile. They shouldn't necessarily, um, like when it says I will need, like that's another like really firm thing that's saying like, oh, I have to have this. Um, a trapeze bar, it could be helpful, but you do not need to redecorate your home to have a trapeze bar in it. Now, there is other things you do want to have, um, like... Um, you know, uh, what do you call them? Shower chairs, um, safety bars in your bathroom, but trapeze bar in your um, home for bed mobility, eh, I don't think it's needed. I will need some physical and occupational therapy after surgery. Well, I think we've already established. Yes, that's good. Now, I will say, you know, my um, father-in-law, he had his hip replaced a little while ago. And um, I remember I was so excited because I was like, oh, something I teach, I can actually talk about this. And then, um, you know, my husband came to me and he's like, yeah, the doctor says he doesn't need any physical therapy just to get up and walk. And I was like, but I mean, this guy was like the best guy in this area. So I was like, I guess I have to trust his judgment. Like he's the like very like well-known and um, has had very good success rates. Um, it may depend on the approach. I think with the posterior, they're usually going to need versus the anterior, they might not need as much. Um, but in general, we want to get them moving and they're usually going to need some help. Remember physical therapy, mobility, occupational therapy is going to help more with activities of daily living and those adaptive devices. So we're going to say, yes. Um, I will soak in a bathtub to help with pain management after surgery. Well, I feel like they're not good. Like, how are they going to get up? <laughs> so like, I mean, that sounds great, but how are they going to get up? Um, and, um, you know, the, the pain management, a lot of this stuff is going to be some medications, maybe some um, getting up, getting moving is going to help a lot with their pain. So I'm going to say, eh, no, I don't think that's safe. So A, yes. B, er, C, er, D, yes. E, er, so A and D are the only correct ones. So and just note that this says posterior hip replacement education. There isn't, ah. Uh, Stop, stop ruining my life. Um, uh, there is an anterior too. We usually focus on the posterior when we teach. Anterior is less invasive and I'm sure it's going to be everything of the future. We still teach back here in the, it's not really the dark ages. We still do this procedure all the time, um, but um, we still do teach about this. So there's more problems with this one. So usually it's the one we test over. Um, I don't have any specific, a lot of these are the same. There's some of the stuff that's the same for anterior. It's just less restrictive. Uh, so effectively, I do not want this patient. And by the way, this is the picture I've been talking about this whole time. So you see like when it dislocates, it pops out above um, that joint socket, which is why there's that limb shortening. So special precautions to prevent dislocation is going to be avoiding like more than 90 degrees of flexion um, or like I think flexion, like, you know, we do not want them flexing more than 90 degrees or bending down too far. Just think of, I do not want this patient doing deep squats. Um, and so then we also don't want them to adduct. So we don't want them to, um, cross their legs, any sort of internal rotation or effectively, I don't want them to squat too deep and I don't want them to, um, uh, what do you call it? To go inward at all, like tw legs towards each other. I don't want any crossing. I don't want any internal rotation where they're, um, they're, uh, they're pointing their toes in towards the middle. Um, so I want nothing towards the middle and not too deep. Mm. Anyway. Um, and so 
Needless to say, for at least six weeks following this procedure, uh, we want to use caution um, with certain activities. So here's kind of the list. Um, this is not an all exhaustive list, but um, we do not want them to cross their legs. So a lot of times the doctor may even tell them like when they're in bed or when they're in a chair to keep a pillow between their legs, because sometimes you can do it without even thinking about it. Um, a lot of people cross their legs without even thinking about it. So they a lot of times the pillow is just a reminder, like, don't do it. Um, elevated toilet seat to prevent that deep squat or that um, very low position. Um, place a chair inside the shower or tub. Um, and then um, avoiding no tub baths, no no driving for a while. Um, it's not going to be safe. It's just partially the position, um, but also um, you might have limited ability, like safety wise. Um, you have to build your strength back up. Um, the pillow between the legs we already talked about hip in a neutral straight position we don't want to be getting all wonky or do anything crazy with um our positioning um keep natural alignment um if you know we're going to talk about when to call your doctor um sit in a chair with arms so just like with back um, problems you want to sit in a chair with arms for optimal support um, do not put your socks and shoes on without an adaptive device for at least six weeks. So like that last question, if it would have said for six weeks, not forever, it would have been correct. Um, but, you know, for a while, they're going to need help. And I mean, hey, sometimes people might figure out these adaptive devices are actually pretty cool, make life easier, but it's not required. So you, they should call their sur uh, surgeon if they notice a deformity, like literally it'll feel like a lump in their buttocks. Um, if they have sudden severe pain, if their limb gets shorter, they have that external rotation. Again, those are all your warning signs of a relist dislocation. Here are some of those adaptive devices I talked about. There's all these scrubbers, um, grabbers, and stuff like that. Be careful. A lot of older patients, they'll have these grabbers and they'll grab you. They'll, they'll pinch you and stuff with them. Um, they're they're pretty, uh, pretty uncomfortable. Um, there's also these cool little adaptive things, like I said, to help put your socks on or your shoes on. Um, you can see some elevated toilet seats here, these fun little fancy um, shower chairs, or these cool devices to get yourself in and out of your bathtub. So lots of um, cool devices that have been made. And if you're ever wanting to get out of nursing, create a device, it's a better way to make money um, if you have the brain for it. Anyway, that is it for cute musculoskeletal, um, chronic musculoskeletal coming to you soon if you can manage sitting on the edge of your seat until then. See you later.